I believe this is the most unique, amazing job in the country. You know, it, because like you can truly offer a kid something here that nobody else in the country can do. Right side. Here comes the tail and storage hammers Conley. Storage hammers Conley. You know, former Notre Dame All-American Chris Storage once said that he dreamed of hitting a quarterback so hard that his head came off and went rolling down the field. When I talk to people who are new to leadership or anybody, I have to say, look, what have you done for them before you ask? That's an important question. Not far behind was Chris Zorich, who led the line and tackles for the third straight year. I was the number one fullback in the country, but I was the number two uh, linebacker in the country. And again, that nose man, Chris Zorich, came across with initial penetration. He's out of vocational high school, the same high school that produced Dick Butkus. And he's playing just like a Butkus right now. Welcome, everyone, to the Zorich Podcast. I am Chris Zorich. And on today's show, we have a, a, a legend in the making, so to speak, uh, the Dick Corbett head football coach at the university. That's, that's a lot. At the University of Notre Dame, Marcus Freeman, welcome to the podcast. Um, things have changed in the last couple months for you. Uh, it, it's it's insane. The last time we talked on the podcast, you were the defensive coordinator at the University of Notre Dame. Hey, the Bob Hinton. Oh, there you go. I'm sorry. The, the, the Bob Hinton <laughs> defensive coordinator at the University of Notre Dame. And now just one, about five, six, 11, no, eight months later, you're the head coach. That doesn't happen. What? What? I, I mean, I'm speechless. What has happened in the last couple of months with your life? Well, it's been crazy. It's a whirlwind. <laughs> and if you would have asked me last year at this time when we were talking, hey, next year you're going to be the head coach at the University of Notre Dame, what would your life be like? I would have thought I would have been a completely different person. You, you hmm. think – when you're on the other side, hey, you're a completely different person. But you you realize some of your obviously a lot of your day to day responsibilities change, sure. right? The way people view you changes, and mm -hmm. those are things that I've learned. People see you in a different light. The things you say um, can mean a little bit more. But mm -hmm. who you are as a person, who you are in your heart, how you accomplish your day to day tasks, that doesn't change. I'm still the same person that was the the defensive coordinator. Well, and, and it's interesting because not being the head man and before, and it's so interesting because, you know, I want to ask, you know, has your leadership style changed any? Because, and, and I say this because when folks saw this video, and I'm, I'm going to show the video of you being announced to the team in a little bit, but after folks saw that, they commented and this is all social media stuff, so it really doesn't mean anything. But it's interesting because a couple of reporters talked about it too, and they said, wow, like the players really like him. Can he be a disciplinarian as well? And I kind of laughed, right? I was like, okay, that's come from somebody who is not involved in the team. That comes from somebody who is not involved in team sport, right? Because at the end of the day, I mean, they love you because you're a disciplinarian. So that, that's kind of an interesting thing. I want to kind of talk to you about that is, you know, has the leadership style changed and kind of what's the feeling now around the team? Yeah. Well, I definitely haven't become this guy that walks around um, with a stick and says, everybody better do their job. Or you're going to get <laughs> smacked. You know, um, it's funny. I had a conversation with coach Holtz a couple weeks ago. Great. And the first thing he said to me was, none of my players would ever call me a player's coach. And I'm like, oh, here we go. I talked to Tim Brown. And the first thing Tim Brown said, well, Coach Holtz, he wasn't a player's coach. We didn't mm. like him. We didn't love him. And I'm like, mm. you know, I said, here's, here's the, the reality of, of, I think if you talk to any of my players, the way I lead is as a teammate. I'm a leader as a teammate. What does that mean is that, you know what? You're going to know me just like you know your teammates. You're going to know who Marcus Freeman is. You're going to know my wife. You're going to know my kids. You're going to know. There's no curtains up. That's the, always been the way I led. I'm always going to be honest. But what that does is it builds trust, right? And you're going to trust me. And so when I push and when I discipline 
And when I say, here's the standard and I'm going to hold you to it, you understand that I care about you. You understand that it's to help you reach your goals. And that's always been the way I led as a teammate. So these kids know that, you know what, Coach Freeman, trust us. And when we win, guess what? We win as a team. And when we lose, guess what? We lose as a team. There's never going to be a point where I say it's your fault. No, it's our fault. It's us doing this thing together. And so I know if you interviewed, as, as hopefully you get the chance to interview a lot of our players, they're going to say, hey, Coach Freeman, we love him. And we hug him, but he's going to hold us accountable to the standards. You know, and I think that's so interesting because here I have the, the picture of this is awesome meeting right here with uh, you and Coach Oates. Um, well, and I think it's interesting because he is a thousand percent right. He was definitely not a player's coach. But what people don't understand, and, and I, obviously he does, Tim Brown does, other folks, I mean, there are different styles of coaching. Flat out. And so when someone says that, and I mean, I can guarantee you that when you talk to your former players, it's going to be consistent when you were that GA, when you first kind of got your first kind of excitement about being a coach, right? So that player is going to feel the same way that he did about you then that your current player is going to feel about you now being a head coach. And it's okay to show love, show empathy, show respect. And oftentimes people don't understand that, hey, he's going to hug the guy, but it, but is he also going to be a disciplinarian? And then it's like, well, I do that with my kids. I love my kids. I kiss my kids. And if, if they get out of line, I have to discipline them. So it's just, it's just interesting. Well, I think you said you had a great point right there. It's the greatest to me, one of the greatest forms of love or displays of love is discipline, Right. And it's the same discipline that you display for your children when you want to correct a behavior. I love my children to death, right? And the greatest display of that affection I have for them is discipline. I dropped my son off at school this morning. We're on spring break. And so before I came into the office, I dropped my son off at school. And we had a nice conversation about uh, this B minus and C that I saw in his uh, <laughs> interim report. And so, but he has to understand it's because I love him. Like you're underachieving. And so I have to discipline. But Chris Zeter's leadership styles have changed. When I was young, my dad, he's an older guy. He was 43 when he had me. And mm. so he's almost 80 now. And my dad was in military, um, 26 years, a leader. And when my dad said, you do this, yes, sir, there wasn't a discussion. Right. But as you see with a lot of our young people now, there's a lot of young people we have that don't, one, don't have a father at home. Sure. Right? And so they don't understand that discipline of, of if I say do something, you do it. No, it, it doesn't always work that way. The kids nowadays say, tell me why. And if you're not willing to do that and you say, no, I say you turn right and you turn right, you're, might lo you're gonna lose the majority of these kids uh -huh. and they'll revolt against you. And so I think for me, it's the ability to connect with them. It's ability to earn their trust. And then you discipline them. They know you love them and then you can hold them accountable and then you can discipline them. And so that's my leadership style is to gain trust. Let them know I love them. I tell them all the time, not too many men. I'm not going to tell them. No, I love you. Right. I make the decision to love you. Love is not a feeling. Right. It is a choice. And I choose to love our players. But mm. I'm also choosing to hold you to the standards that we've set to help you achieve our goals. Mm. Now, see... The first time we had a chance to talk about this, I wanted to give you at least another five, 10 minutes in a, in, 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 on the field somehow. I wanted you to put me in. Now I even feel more excited about the fact that I would love to give you maybe a minute, maybe two minutes. I think I got at least 90 seconds I could suit up. I do have one more year of eligibility. I only <laughs> played four years. So, but you know, it's so interesting because when you talk about that, you talk about kind of how, how coaching has, has changed over the years, how leadership has, has changed over the years, you know, you have to be able to adapt, right? I mean, you have to be able to show the your student athletes that you will change with the times. Why? Because you love them, because you want them to be successful. And yes, Coach Holtz was not a player's coach, but I guarantee you that you talk to any one of us old guys talking about trust, love, and commitment, you talk about what's important now, we can spit out the stuff 
like it was just yesterday. And that is because of the respect and love we had for him. Although, yes, he wasn't a player's coach, but he still gave that that, that great – he gave of himself, and we saw him. Yeah. I think the definition of what a player's coach is could change too because ultimately I believe that you guys trusted Coach Holtz. Absolutely. Right? And you were willing to run through brick walls for him. Absolutely. And because our players hug me, that doesn't mean that they don't trust me. That doesn't right. mean that, hey, I, I'm just their friends. Right. You know, it means that they know who I am. Maybe it's the connection of being 35 when your name head coach, right? Coach Holtz wasn't 35 when he was your head coach. And exactly. so at 50, I don't know if I walk through that locker room, they're going to hug me. Like, oh, <laughs> you know? um, but I think the ability to connect with the young people is so important. I think you said something great. You look at this generation and, and you look at the way they challenge everything. Sure. That's something you'll hear me talk about, the golden standard. You look at the protests. You look at um, even some of the, you know, the, the, the protests last year of the police brutality and things like that. Like, mm-hmm. our, the new generation isn't just standing for, okay, I'm going to do it because you said so. Right. They're going to say, tell me right. why. Let's find a better way. Right. And so we as coaches have to be able to adapt because we ask our kids to adapt. Adaptability is so important. And it's something that we as an entire program have to be able to do. So speaking about this um, kind of amazing moment, and when I saw this, I mean, I was throwing this all over social media. And I talked to Tom Mendoza. We, we, we both went nuts over this. I'm going to show the video of you kind of walking in the locker room and then come back and kind of get your kind of take on what was the feeling kind of behind this. So here it is. We're extremely proud of you guys on your focus and your ability to lock in all week long this week, okay? It was awesome to see, awesome to be a part of. It shows who you are, your DNA, your mental toughness, your physical toughness, the way you compete, the way you care about each other, okay? That's what this team run is gonna be about. Competing, getting after it with mental and physical toughness, and being the best in the country in what we do. So are we ready to do that? Yes, sir. All right, so, what I'm gonna do now, okay, because your brand new head football coach. Yeah. Yeah. I got I get chills right now. Right? <laughs> How did? I, please walk us through that experience. I mean, what, what was it like, kind of being there, there yeah. with those guys? I probably got to build you up to that moment. Please, and, you know, you look at Monday of that week, right? I'm in a school. Coach Kelly calls me. I have six missed phone calls from Coach Kelly. I go outside the school and I call him, and he says, "I'm sorry. I know you just got here less than a year ago, but I took the head coaching job at LSU." I said, "Okay," and. <sighs> He offers me a job as a Demons Corner LSU. And it's just so many thoughts are going through my head. And I got to be with this recruit. Like, I owe it to this recruit to be with him and his family. And <sighs> um, I go in there and I see him and, and come back out. And I'm driving home and my mind's all over the place. And I remember going home and talking to my wife. By, by that time, I started getting some phone calls from some higher ups and that deal with the football program about the interest I would have to be the head coach. And obviously, yes, yes, I would. Did I really deep down think it would happen? I I mean, it's no, probably not. There was a a doubt, but I'm, but the longer it went on, right. The conversations you had, you were like, man, this, this, this might really become a reality. So then Wednesday, this goes through Tuesday. Um, I'm actually recruiting. I'm on my way to Michigan. I could not sit in my house. So I had some conversations all Monday night. I'm talking about 11 p.m., 1 p.m., 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 4 a.m., the last conversation, maybe 6 a.m. I did not sleep one day. So I'm sitting in my house, and I'm like, I can't just sit here and see what Notre Dame's going to do. So I go back on the road recruiting. And I'm almost at a school, and Jack Swarbrick calls me. And he says, hey, I want to meet with you tonight. So I said, okay, boop, turn around. Right, I'm two hours from the school, or maybe an hour from the school. Turn around right in the highway, and I fly back home. 
and I'm sitting there and he calls me and he says, hey, I can't meet tonight. I got a couple of things I got to do. Let's meet tomorrow. So I have a Wednesday, this gets me to Wednesday morning. I have a four, four and a half hour interview, just me and him. And finally, he calls me Wednesday night and says, I think I know who my next head coach is going to be, which is documented. They videoed it and it was awesome. And, you know, his his strict orders were you. I'm letting you tell your wife. I don't want you to tell your kids. You cannot pick up the phone. You can't call your parents. You cannot leave your house until mm -hmm. I tell you. Mm -hmm. And so that video is from Friday morning. So that goes from Wednesday when he told Wednesday night, he tells me this to Friday. Mm. So all I want to do in those 48 hours, since I know I'm the head coach, is, is be around your team, your players. Right. And so when they opened that door, it was just a sigh of relief to just mm. go hug my player. Mm. It wasn't, let's give them a speech. Let's go rah, rah, right. Let's tell them exactly. what we're going to do. Exactly. It was to be with your guy. And if I could stay there and hug them and be with them and just relax with them, I would. But I knew at that point they needed me to say a couple things to them as their new leader. And, and I did. But that was a lot of emotion from a long week and 48 hours of knowing you're going to be the head coach and the ability to embrace your team, man. That was the, the, a moment that I'll never forget. Mm, I got the chills again. Man. This is, <laughs> but, but, but see, this is that raw motion, right? That happens when there was no script for what happened, like what you just talked about in the last 48 hours. Right. But so without knowing any of that, the player side, they're going through all this emotion, right? They've just been told this guy who was their leader is now gone. Who's going to lead them? And, oh, by the way, they have a chance to possibly compete for the national championship. So they got all these crazy emotions going on. As a 18-year-old, that's hard to process. As a 21-year-old, as a parent of those kids in that locker room, what are they thinking? So, so that's kind of all the stuff that's going on in my head. And, Marcus, I guarantee you, the guys who are in that locker room, they will never, ever – forget that moment because that was a moment for them and their new coach and everything they've been through. And it was not good. I mean, a lot of emotion going on, friends talking, call parents calling, everything was going on. They know nothing, right? And they can't, Oh, this is who I think this is just what's going on. I don't know anything. Then all of a sudden to have it culminate to that point and see that. So they're, I mean, it was just an amazing experience. And oh, by the way, you're going to be their leader. And so when you see that, when you see that raw emotion, man, I was shooting at the people that didn't even like sports. You're like, oh my God, who is that guy? Right? I mean, these he's a great leader. And they're like, I don't even know who he is, but that's an amazing environment. Think of the possibility of, of going walking into your workplace, being a team leader at work, being a manager. And having your employees care that much about you. And that, that's what I thought was so amazing that the, there, there's raw emotion in that locker room. And from 18 to 21, 50 years, whatever it was, they're going to remember that for the rest of their lives. Yeah, it's, oh man, you, 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 you've said it so well in terms of, you know, when there is a, a probably a, not a lack, but a question in leadership. I've seen it in terms of when our staff right now, when, when guys had left, right, this transition period, the absence of leadership creates this, this doubt, this uncertainty sure. about the future. And so mm -hmm. for them, they had a week of uncertainty. And I think they wanted something. You knew this is what they wanted, but there still was uncertainty about who's going to be their leader. And ultimately, Jack Schwarberg and President uh, Father Jenkins, they made the decision like, I don't want to shortchange them because mm -hmm. our players, they fought, they pushed, but they right. made the decision, mm -hmm. right? And it was a, a moment where they felt like something they really, really wanted was given to them. They wanted, they wanted Marcus Freeman to be their head coach. Here's your reward. But they also had answers to who's going to be their leader. You know what? You could they could have hired anybody, and at some point, the players would have been like, "Okay, this is our leader. Mm -hmm. This is the leader. We're gonna follow." Mm -hmm. But I think that's the moment too that they knew who their leader was. It was a leader that they wanted, and they were ready to march forward. And so um, that was a lot of emotion. You can you can see it in that video um, for multiple different reasons. And from then on, it's the, it's been work time. You put your work hat on. You enjoy that emotional experience. You don't want to rush it, 
but now we put our war hats on and we go to work and uh, that's gotten to us about three and a half months later here we are <laughs> well <laughs> speaking about that that the, the, the work um the idea of, of you being successful is obviously important and, and it was interesting because you mentioned before that um you know, you put anybody in this situation, I mean, folks are going to be excited about the head coach of Notre Dame. Now, the kids were excited about you, but when I started to show that clip to former players, um, after you were named, I had a bunch of former players on the podcast, showed them that clip to a T. I and mean, some of these guys like 65, right? I mean, I'm 53. Some of these guys like 65, they're like, I'm in. And put me in, coach. And that was the feeling they had because they understood – and again, not not knowing what you just shared with us, but as a player at Notre Dame, it's a special place. And some of those guys have been through coaching changes, okay? I mean, Tim Brown, one of the guys we talked to, he talked about how that was an amazing um, um, experience for, for those kids because he had to go through coaching change. So the, the former players I talked to, they, they put themselves right there with your current team and I mean, guys are getting chills. I mean, every, every time, and I've seen that video God, probably about 50,000 times. Every time I see it, man, I get the chills because I'm, I feel as though I'm living the life through those players, right? In, in, in that emotion, that raw emotion and the ability to really kind of express that in a way that's so important. And I am not a fan of, cameras in the locker room, but I'm so grateful that we were able to catch that experience and see it because I mean, that really allowed us as fans to kind of see how they care about you as a head coach and you as a person, you as a human being. And, and I don't think we, we would have been able to have that same feeling if they just announced you as the head coach. I mean, yes, everybody would have been excited about it, but seeing that emotion, and I'm not the only guy talking. I mean, for for the lap, for the next 24 hours, it was all over ESPN and everything else. And the idea that, that we were able to be invited into such an intimate moment was, was just so important. Yeah, that's the, you know, that's the unique part about social media and mm -hmm. uh, about you know being able to find ways to connect maybe the outside with what's going on and sure. you feel a part of it. And so there's parts of the football locker room that you want to be just authentic. You want right. it to be the players only. But I think what you saw was an authentic moment. You saw a real moment. That Absolutely. was a stage, as you said. Absolutely. Um, and, and I'm so grateful that the entire country, but especially the alumni, the people that love Notre Dame were able to experience that with me. I, I mean – Honestly, I mean, there's, there's guys, I talk to guys who hate Notre Dame. They're like, dude, if he was my coach, man, you know, and, and a lot of these, a lot of the emotion is just seeing it, you know, and, and again, these are not Notre Dame fans and they're like, wow, I wish we had a coach like that. You know, so the idea that, I mean, not only were you, I mean, obviously this is a goal for you was to be a head coach someday, but, oh, gee, it's going to happen in, you know, 11 months after you get to the new program. Um, these aren't things that, that happen very often. And, and I, I do want to comment, um, when the news broke that Brian Kelly left, I was actually doing a podcast about college football. And my co-host was like, you know, hey, who do you think should be the head coach? And he was like, dude, you're Marcus Freeman fan. What about him? And I was like, absolutely not. Too young. No way. He, he just got there. That's crazy. He's like 25. There's no way they're going to do that. So I started naming off some other people. And literally, of course, after that, after your name, people dog me, dude, that's your boy. How can you do that? I'm like, look, I'm being honest, but hey, man, not only am I drinking the Marcus Freeman water, who are Kool-Aid, I'm sorry, not only am I drinking Marcus Freeman Kool-Aid, but I understand why his players feel that way, right? I understand why this happened? Did I? I mean, no, I didn't think that was going to happen. And I know from your speech, when you accepted the job at the press conference, you said you didn't think it was going to happen either. You know, so the fact that it happened is just such an amazing experience for you. Yeah. Who who would ever thought Notre Dame would have hired a first time head coach at 35 and he's black? And, and, and he's black. whoever <laughs> would have thought, you know, so nobody believed. But 
you know, the more you get to know Jack Schwarber and the more you get to look at the history of this place, of Notre Dame football, you really look and say, this is what Notre Dame's about. This is what Jack Schwarber's about. This is this is where we were built on. You know, we're independent. We're willing to play anybody in the country. We're willing to, you know, challenge everything is what I like to say. And and that's what Jack Schwarbrick has done. He's not going to um, change who he is and his values. He's going to commit to the values that got him here. And you know what? He believes this is what's best for this football program. And he said, I'm not going to worry about what outsiders say. I'm going to follow my heart and what I believe is best. And that's what he did. Now, what is it? Now it's my job and our job as a football program to make sure we prove that decision right. Right. And that's in, in a year or two years from now, if we don't make this the right decision, people are going to say, I told you so. Mm -hmm. I told you so. Mm -hmm. And so that's a little bit of my motivation, not everything, to work sure. extremely hard to make sure we have success. You know, now the biggest part of my motivation, I said in my press conference, is still is the players. I don't wake up every day and say, dang it, if we win or if we lose, I'm going to be fulfilled. No, it's that, hey, what can I do today to make sure that these players reach their goals? What can I do to make sure that our current players reach their football goals, their academic goals, their mm -hmm. life goals? And that's what really, really motivates me. But guess what? Part of their football goals is winning a national championship. Well, I'm going to do everything in my power and work tirelessly to make sure that we are able to give that to our players. And that's what people, what you're going to notice about and learn about Marcus Freeman, and it, it's never been about me. And it never will be about me. It is about making sure those around me reach their goals. That's my biggest motivation. I've said this before in the Mendoza. Um, I had a uh, fireside talk last week and somebody said, what was one of your proudest moments last year as a defense coordinator? It was when we beat Wisconsin and we played well on defense and Coach Kelly became the winningest head coach in Notre Dame history. He deserved it. And that's what I wanted mm -hmm. to give him. I want to give Notre Dame its 12th national championship because – Notre Dame deserves it. And that's why I'm going to work tirelessly to make sure that this place and our kids have success. Mm, that's beautiful. You are, I hope you're enjoying this episode of the Zorch Podcast with our special guest, head football coach at Notre Dame, Marcus Freeman. I hope you're having as much fun watching it as we did doing the actual interview. As you can tell, he's a great guy. You can also check us out live as I'll be interviewing Coach Freeman at the Notre Dame Club of Chicago's Rockney Gala on May 12th at the Chicago Cultural Center at 78 East Washington in Chicago, Illinois. Go to www.ndchicago.org for more information and to purchase tickets. Doors open at 6 p.m. for the cocktail reception. Then I'll be conducting a Q&A session with Coach Freeman. Of course, there will be a raffle with some great prizes and a special VIP experience for the Notre Dame-Clemson game it's sure to be a blast. All funds raised from this event will benefit the Notre Dame Club of Chicago's Scholarship Foundation. Hope to see you guys there. Kind of walk us through. So you, you officially get named. We have a press conference. And we actually, myself and Pat Terry were there. And this is a great picture of the queen now, I guess we can call her, of Notre Dame football. This is your wife, Joanna. Um, kind of walk us through like the, the next 24 hours because I couldn't keep up with you on social media because like it was almost like you showed one of those graphs with like the airplane going or, like what was the next 24 hours like? Wow. Yeah, you're right. That's the queen of the Freeman household. And, <laughs> um, yeah, the first lady at Notre Dame football for sure. She is, uh, I want to make sure that I give her her proper respect where it's due because I couldn't do my job without her. And so uh, she's awesome. But, you know, after that press conference, so leading up to that, that morning, I probably did four or five interviews, Zooms, you know, for ESPN, whatever right. I had to do. Um, I had a moment to kind of get my mind right for the press conference. Then I had to meet with Jack and uh, Father Jenkins for a while before we went in there. We walk in there, it's still kind of a blur. Um, but what an unbelievable, what an unbelievable time. So I saw my wife give her a kiss, kiss the kids afterwards. My parents were there. I didn't get really a chance to talk to them. And then we had our first team meeting right away. Bam. 
So I had a first team meeting. I just wanted to say, hey, it's over. All the press conference, everything's over. Let's get to work. Let's get to work. I'm gone for a week recruiting. When I get back, it's go time. And so I wanted mm -hmm. to address our players. Like I said, it's always about our players. Yep. I ran upstairs, had a quick Zoom, uh, another quick interview Zoom, and they took me straight to the airport. And so got on a plane. And if I can remember, I'm kind of walking through it. So I get on a plane <laughs> at probably about 3 o'clock. All right. We fly to Wisconsin. And we stop and see an offensive lineman, Billy. Uh, Billy who just signed here. And we see Billy, and then we fly to – well, hold on. Uh, At this point, I mean, are you wearing the same suit? Did you at least get a suit. chance to change? Oh, I, have a chain. <laughs> I didn't eat. I didn't do it. I just got Oh, my it. God. And so we stopped in Wisconsin. Then we stopped either North Dakota or South Dakota just to get, get fuel. And then we finished in um, Washington. Okay. And so we're seeing a wide out in Washington. So this is, we get to his house at probably 9 o'clock Pacific time, West Coast time. OK, see him. So nine to 11 p.m. So we said we have to fly to the next place so we can sleep a little bit and then be in Arizona in the morning. So we fly from there. We land in Arizona probably about three o'clock mountain time. OK, oh and so we still haven't slept, still really haven't eaten, maybe eat, ate a little bit at one of the kids house. And then um, we get to the hotel, we fall asleep, probably about five Pacific time. I mean, five mountain time. And I couldn't I mean your body's just naturally going to wake up about seven o'clock. I got two hours of sleep and we started getting and going to that. And we were just all over the country, everywhere oh you need to be. God. And so we dropped some coaches off like coach Reese. We left somewhere in Texas and then I mm. had to go to New North. I don't know where I went. Right, right, right. Only person that was with me was Emily, Emily Reagan. She is our social media filmer. So okay. she was with me the entire time. Oh my and she experienced God. what it really was like to be with the head coach. And, and oh she was God. awesome. But, um, Finally, we got back and kind of could decompress a little bit, but that was a wild, wild week. Ah, and, 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 and here, I mean, it, it goes to show you the reputation you start off. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't even start off with the Notre Dame, but the, the reputation you have when you first came to Notre Dame was being a voracious recruiter. Well, gee, guess what? I mean, you didn't even. I mean, I mean, I mean, I would have like. Sat down, had a cocktail, a cigar, maybe. I mean, just <laughs> give me like, just give me five minutes to enjoy it. But no, you jump on a plane. And so the idea, and I want folks who are watching and listening to understand. I mean, this isn't. I mean, he was just given the reins, the keys to one of the most historic football programs in the history of college football. And oh, by the way, within the next hour, he's on the trail recruiting i mean that's in itself is awesome the fact that you're able to do it then you get home do you even kiss her? i mean is she even awake i mean I, I just you're like honey i'm home she's like what like mm -hmm. i didn't even know you were going like <laughs> she's still i don't know if i've still kissed her we were still <laughs> one thing after another and uh I told her spring break, we're going to take some me, you time. But mm. obviously today I'm in the office. I, I told her the one thing about spring break is you get the coaches out of here so you can actually get some work done. Right. People are always <laughs> in your office. And so uh, this week I'm going to definitely take her out and, and, and just give her a little bit of uh, appreciation for the things she's done. But, but Chris, that's, that's who I am, right? And that maybe when we're done, I don't know, I'm going to go as hard as I can, as mm. hard as I possibly can until mm. I look at my wife and say, we can't, I can't go that hard anymore. Right. And, right. and at that point, when I can't go as hard as we've been going, it's probably time to stop. And so, mm. but I think that will be the moment we look back and say, look where we came. Look, look how far we've come because celebrating that moment, you're, you're, you're stopping the progress, right? right. Let's right. utilize this opportunity. Go get some recruits. That's the number one way you can enhance your program. Mm. Talent acquisition. There's no other. There's no other way that can truly enhance your program except for bringing in the best talent in the country. And so, we have to do that. And that's always been my mindset: is to get the best players in the country. And and it's still today on March seventh. It's the same mindset: is we have to bring in the best players in the country, and then we'll we'll have a culture here that's so strong that they'll mold to our culture. Right. They're, they'll mold to the things and the standards that we have, because if they won't, they're not going to fit in here.
And so go get them. Go get the right players, the best players in the country that fit this place. Mold them to an unbelievable culture. Hold them accountable. And then let's get ready to prepare to, to win these games. Well, and when you put together a staff, right? So, I mean, I, I had a chance to watch your press conference when you were able to announce Al Golden as the defensive coordinator. Sorry, the Bob Hinton defensive coordinator. I have to get these, <laughs> get these names right. Um, you talked about kind of what you saw or what you wanted in a coach. Can you kind of share with us a little bit about kind of the understanding of what you want to see in your your coaching staff, one that you were able to put together? Yeah. One, I wanted great men. And that's not lip service. Like, if you're in this for yourself and you're in this for your own gain, then you're not in it for the right reason. I wanted men that want to serve our players. And that's not a soft term. That is a term that you're going to work tirelessly to make sure our players reach their goals. That's all I mean. When I say we're going to serve our players, our job is to make sure our players reach their goals, and we have to work tirelessly to do that. And so that was number one. Number two was great recruiters. We need 10, not nine, not eight, not seven. We need 10 relentless recruiters. And, and I want to be number one. I want to set the standard on how we recruit. And then three, we need guys that understand the game of football. I told you earlier, you're not going to – follow me if I can't make you better at football. Sure. I can be the greatest person in the world. I can be your buddy. But if you, if I can't make you a better football player, then I don't know. Why am I spending time with you? Our kids want to be first round picks. Our kids aren't here just to play ball at Notre Dame. They want to be produced and be ready to go to the NFL and be in the draft. And so we have to make sure that we make them better football players. And so a coach has to know what he's doing in terms of building these people to make them great football players. But those are the three things I was looking for in terms of just overall. With Coach Golden, which you brought up earlier, it was a chance to bring in somebody that was a former head coach. Sure. We didn't have any former head coaches on our staff. And he is a, an extremely intelligent human being that – was willing to say, hey, I'm going to come in here. Let me just learn. Let me learn the foundation. Let me learn what your players have been taught because this will be their third defense coordinator in three years. And as a former player, I understand how difficult that can be. And so Coach Golden at least came in saying, let me learn their terminology, learn the things they've learned, and then make my own enhancements. And so what you've seen in the first two weeks that have been here is he's already – enhance the things that our players have learned. And so I don't know who that last defensive coordinator is, but I think he's going to put him to shame a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I, I, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I'm sitting there listening to you, and, and I hope the folks that are listening, that are watching, understand what Marcus just – what Coach Freeman just said. He wanted to bring in somebody with head coaching experience. He does not have head coaching experience. Where is his ego? Where is Mar why can't Marcus say, hey, you know what? I'm the head man here. These people are going to listen to me. I'm not going to listen to anybody else. You didn't say that. You said, hey, I don't have head coaching experience. I'm bringing in a guy who has it. Now, I've had a lot of mentors, and, and a lot of folks have talked to me about leadership and one of the one, one of the main things they've all talked about was checking your ego at the door, okay? Because you can't do everything. You don't know everything, but you can find people who do. And guess what? You put aside your ego, and I want folks to understand this because a lot of people won't do that. A lot of people will create a staff, a bunch of folks who they're the main guy. Hey, I'm the head coach. Y'all got to listen to me. And, oh, by the way, I'm not going to bring anybody who has more experience than me. Please talk yeah. about that because I want people to understand what, as a coach, what that means, but also as a leader. Yeah. Well, I, I, I started this podcast off by saying I'm a leader as a teammate. I've always been a part of a team. And that's who I am at the core of my heart. And when you do that, when you lead that way, you're willing to say, I don't have every answer. Okay. And the other thing I said earlier is that this isn't about Marcus Freeman. This is about making the University of Notre Dame's football team, football team the greatest football team it possibly can be. And so that's where my focus is, is how do we make this team as best as it can? Not why, how can we make Marcus Freeman as best as he can be? No. <laughs> I want to be a person that helps this team achieve the greatest heights it's ever had. 
And so that's what my motivation and that's what my goals are. And so in order to do that, you have to put bring in people that aren't like, I don't need 10 Marcus Freeman. I want people that are complete opposite of me, that are strong in the areas that I'm not. And because I'm willing to admit that we all have blind spots, that we all have areas that we are not the most efficient at. And so I want to bring in people that really are, are strong in those areas because ultimately that's going to help our coaching staff. That's going to help our team achieve its ultimate its ultimate goals and results. And so that's where my mindset is. Put Marcus Freeman, put Al Golden, put everybody aside. What can we do to make sure the University of Notre Dame football team is as best as it can be? I, so I have one more year left. I, I don't know what I can do. Maybe, like I said, maybe 15, just a, do a calisthenic or something. Man. I, I want to play. <laughs> I, I, I wish I had a chance to, to play for you. We're going to wrap this up a little bit because I know you got a thousand things going on. But one of the things I want to talk about, you mentioned talent. And you talked about how um, in order to improve, you need to have good talent. And right now you're doing amazing things in recruiting. Talk a little bit of, to us a little bit about how the transfer portal is assisting Notre Dame and achieving that goal. Yeah, it's 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 unique. The transfer portal is real, and um, we've utilized it very uh, a little bit in bringing in talent. You know, graduate mm-hmm. transfer has been huge. You know, we bring in a lot right. of graduate transfers, but you know, transfer an undergraduate transfer, we probably haven't done as many as as you would think some other schools have. Right. Um, that's one because of of our admissions. It's 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 not easy to get into school here, and and we don't ever want to this undervalue the education. Right. That's one well, that's one of the parts that make Notre Dame Notre Dame mm-hmm. is that our education, our degree is so high and so special that we don't want to disvalue that. And so um, but we have used that in terms of players here that have gotten their degree and that, hey, they want to go somewhere that they can play more. That's sure. where the portal can be a good thing is that, you know, what, you got your degree from Notre Dame. You know you're not going to be a starter here, and you want to go play more. I respect that. And let us help you get to a place where you feel like you're going to play. And so those are different ways we've utilized it. Um, But we'll continue to always find ways to push and and to make sure that we are looking at every single venue into making our roster better. How do we enhance our roster? It's always, it's never satisfied. We always want to improve our roster, and that's through the guys we have here, the guys we bring in, the guys out of the transfer portal, and every different facet we have to look at enhancing our roster. So, I don't want this to be about X's and O's because this this is I mean this is amazing. We get a chance to do that months and months later. But the idea, since you were named, there's been two recruiting periods. There's been a birthday. There's been Valentine's Day. There's been a lot of stuff going on. Have you had a chance to like just kind of and, and not in a way where, hey, you, you know, I don't care about you know what's going on around me, but have you had a chance to kind of just sit back and just kind of take that deep breath and look over at your wife and say, wow. Yeah. I mean, have you had a chance to like kind of technically do that yet? Or you know what I think when it when I was first named, we had that moment. Okay. Um and every Every so often, I have a moment where it's almost like you pinch yourself an aha moment, like you're the head coach at Notre Dame. And it's not every day because there's days where you're just working, you're you're taking care of tasks. But, you know, there was one day we're on the road recruiting and I go to the hotel and I get in the hotel probably 11 p.m. at night and I get a chance to kind of just lay down for five minutes and turn on the TV. Well, I turned it to ESPN and they were doing this ESPN 150 special documentary on Notre Dame football. Okay. And you look at the history and tradition and you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm the head coach of Notre Dame. <laughs> and there's those moments that happen that right. you remind yourself the great opportunity that you have. Um, but the majority of those other moments are filled by, hey, sure, hey, get the job done, get the job done, get the job done, work as hard as you can. And then. Um, at the end of it, we'll look back and see where we came. Well, and the thing is, I mean, you have to have those moments, right? Because it, it's so interesting because I, I kind of parallel that with when we when we won the national championship way back 100 years ago at Notre Dame, like we didn't even talk about it. We didn't, you know, hey, we thought we were going to win four more, right? But the idea was, yes, it was there. We did it. We accomplished that. But now it's on to our next task. And our next task was 
going on and hopefully winning another national championship. And so for those folks listening and watching, I mean, it's okay. Now, a lot of folks may say, well, you know, he needs more time to kind of accept that and digest it and enjoy it. I mean, he is the head coach in Notre Dame, and that's great, but there's more that he wants to accomplish, right? I mean, there's more. You want to you want to be that 12th national championship team, and I asked that and kind of knew what your answer was going to be because yes, it's nice to be able to say that yes, I'm the head coach in Notre Dame. Yes, we, we just won the national championship, but there's more. And you don't want to be around that person who goes around beating his chest going, hey, I'm the head coach of Notre Dame, and you're not. Now, again, there are times when you'll accept and enjoy that, but that's not happening every day. That's not happening every moment. Well, I think what you look at is your why. Why Mm -hmm. do you do what you do? Right. What's my inspiration and motivation? It is not to be patted on the back because I'm the head coach at Notre Dame. It's to serve our young people. That's that's why I do it. It's to get the next Chris Zordich to reach his goals. Right. And that's to me why I do this. And and if as long as I continue to remember, you know, what? it's really cool that I'm the head coach at Notre Dame. It's really cool. And there's some perks to it. And, and it, you know, people think you're cooler than what you really are but that's not why i do this Mm -hmm. i don't do it because of that i hope the result of me pushing our players to reach their goals to really really understand the standards and to help them be great men and fathers and husbands and football players i hope the result of that is our 12th national championship i hope and pray because that's that's part of their goals and my goals but that's not what wakes me up every day. It's to truly, truly help these people reach their goals. That is absolutely terrific. Uh, Marcus, this has been great. Uh, I look forward to kind of maybe talking to you after spring ball to kind of see we, we, where you are. I don't want to talk any of that stuff now because it's spring ball. I mean, I can sit there and say, oh, hey, what about this person? What about that person? It's not what this is. This is like literally getting back to basics fundamentals, teaching folks how to play football. You're getting some freshmen that have never played in this level before. So that's an introduction. You got folks coming back. You know what? The idea, I, I've been through it. I know what spring ball is about. So I'd like to talk to you on, on the flip side and kind of see how things are going then. But the idea, I wanted everyone to kind of see what it was like, right? To kind of put themselves in your shoes to see kind of what that moment felt like and really share with us kind of the experience because I mean, folks are just watching on TV, right? And, and you gave us a really great insight on, on what it was about and why, right? And, and, and that's what my podcasts are about is not, Hey, how many touchdowns you scored or how many tackles you had. It's what motivated you to be that type of person. What, you know, what are your leadership qualities? What have you done in this society to make a difference? And, you know, you've obviously made a difference when you just got into coaching, when you just started coaching, and now you'll have a chance to really influence a lot more folks. So, Marcus, this has been great. Thank you so much. I want to congratulate you, your family, Joanne, the kids, because this is not just, you know, one guy in an office making a place. I mean, this is a whole family, literally, and the idea that we're, or I'm sorry, I'm say we like I'm on a team, that, that, that the current team is going to borrow you as you're trying to raise your own kids is a challenge. And that's why you have to have that kind of strong base at home because you want to be able to make those little league events, right? You want Now you're going to miss some. Because you're going to be teaching other folks, kids, how to be men. And that's what I think a lot of people don't understand, right? The, the sacrifice. Because you have your own family that you have to take care of. And so the idea that you're educating our kids, but yet you have your own, is extremely important. And so having someone there to make sure that, that you can get to everything that you can w- without making – um you know, those, those hard decisions is very important. So I want to thank your, your wife, Joanna, for kind of sharing you with 
this Notre Dame family to allow our student athletes to be successful. Thanks, man. And, and it means the world, Chris, to be on here. And you, as I said earlier, man, you've hit the nail on the head. Um, there's a lot of things that I would not be able to do without a um, unselfish wife like I have. But, you know, I, I, I apologize to my kids when I can, just that they didn't, they didn't ask for this, but this is a part of their life and sure. that they have to share their father. And uh, um, I try to blend the two as much as I can. I try to have my kids in here um, as a part of this football family for two reasons. One, because I want to spend time with them. But two, sure. as I told you earlier, I want our players to see me as a father and a husband. And mm. sometimes our actions speak so loud. And mm. uh, I want them to see me as a father, see me not as Coach Freeman, but Dad Freeman and husband Freeman. And, and um, that's important to me. So I appreciate you and I appreciate this this Fort Notre Dame family, um, the, the community for, for having me as their head coach. And, and as I said in my press conference, I'm going to work tirelessly to make sure that this is a success. And I just want to talk about one more thing you, you just mentioned, and you alluded to this before. I mean, when you bring your kids, when these players see their coach being a father, being a leader, I mean, that's important because you mentioned a lot of these kids might not have dads, right? And so their interaction, I, I didn't have a dad and, you know, Lou Holtz was there. I'm listening to him. I'm 18. I don't know what's going on. He's talking about trust, love, and commitment. What's important? Not, th those are things I live by now. So I want people to understand this. I mean, this is not just being a head coach, writing down some X's and O's for kids to follow. I mean, you want to talk about being a role model off the field, you have, and when your coach, when the coach you see every day is interacting with his kids, then I mean that also helps. And so the idea that that you're doing more than just kind of coaching young young men, you know, in, on the field, you're really coaching them in life. So for those eight year old knuckleheads who aren't able to kind of put that together yet and say that. I'm thanking you on their behalf because I know the example you're showing them outside of football is going to make a huge impression on them and their lives. That's awesome, man. You hit it. And uh, that's why we do it. Again, the, the ability to serve these young people. That's why, uh, that's why I do it. And uh, win football games and national championships while we do that, that's just icing on top. I heard that. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, again, we're listening to the Zorch podcast with the Dick Corbett head football coach at the University of Notre Dame, Marcus Freeman. Thank you very much, sir. And I look forward to talking to you again. Go on. Thanks for having me. I look forward to being back. Thanks for having me, brother. All right. Check out YouTube's new super thanks button below if you enjoy and want to support the Zorch podcast. Please hit the thanks button to show your appreciation and leave a comment. Thanks for your support and go Irish.